Hello welcome to another video, please like share and subscribe for more amazing story. True God in Another Worlds, Tensira X Tibate, by Tempest underscore King underscore 20. Chapter 57 Unwelcome Assignment Rimuru Pav, and that's all for today, keep up your training, and we'll see you tomorrow, Art said, his deep voice resonating in the spacious classroom. The sound of the bell echoed through the room, signaling the end of the class. I sobbed with satisfaction as I rose from the cozy recliner and experienced a gratifying soreness in my muscles. Sylvie hopped from my lap and settled herself on my shoulder, her little weight comforted me. I said, ah, this is really stressful, with a voice full of fatigue. Art narrowed his focused look and turned to face me, from what I have seen, it seems like I'm the only one doing the work here, teaching the student. I couldn't help but shrug nonchalantly, a carefree grin playing on my lips. Oh. Come now, Art. You know I'm putting in just as much effort, if not more, than you are. We began marching out of the classroom, the rhythmic sound of our footsteps booming across the empty hallway. Suddenly, I felt a delicate touch on my other shoulder, and I turned to see Avier descending gently on it. A frustrated sigh escaped my lips as I murmured, Ah, what does Cynthia want from us now? Avier hopped from my shoulder to Art's, a silent message that both of us were to accompany him to Cynthia's office. Letting out a weary sigh, Art mirrored my sentiments. We adjusted our course and made our way Cynthia towards his office, our biggest steps with each passing moment. Cynthia rarely called us into her office unless something of utmost importance or troublesome had occurred. Did you do anything again? I queried Art, unable to help but tease him with my skeptical tone. Why do you think it's me every time? You're portraying me as a disruptive child, Art shot back, crossing his arms protectively. I sneezed at his comment, a cheeky smirk tugging at the edges of my lips. Oh, kindly. My darling brother, you are aware, just as I am, that problems always seem to make their way to you. Art rolled his eyes. Oh please, like you're the epitome of perfection. I scoffed at Art's remark, a playful smirk tugging at the corners of my lips. Oh, please. I never claim to be perfect, but at least I don't go around stirring up trouble like you do. Art rolled his eyes, clearly unamused. I don't intentionally stir up trouble, it just seems to gravitate towards me. I raised an eyebrow, unable to hide my amusement. Sure, Art. Trouble seems to have a magnetic attraction to you. It's quite the talent, really. Sylvie, sensing the playful energy between us, lazily interjected, You're not one to talk, Papa. Go to sleep, Sylvie. Go to sleep, I replied my voice laced with affectionate exasperation. HMPH. Sylvie frowned before settling back into her slumber, her soft purring filling the air. As we reached Cynthia's office, we exchanged a knowing glance before knocking on the door. Come in, her voice called from inside, the sound carrying a mix of warmth and authority. As we entered Cynthia's office, the heavy scent of ancient tomes and aged parchment enveloped us, mingling with the soft glow of sunlight filtering through the blinds. The room was a sanctuary of knowledge, shelves overflowing with books that seemed to whisper secrets of centuries past. With papers and scrolls arranged in an orderly jumble all about her, Cynthia was seated at her desk, a bastion of academics. Her glasses rested atop her nose, and her gray hair was pushed back in a tidy manner. Ah, there you two are. Please, have a seat. Gazing up from her papers, Cynthia smiled warmly to see us. Her brown eyes gleamed with interest and intelligence. She waved for us to sit down, her hand arching gracefully over the leather couch in front of her desk. Lying back in the leather chair, I could feel Sylvie's soft weight on my side as she curled up and her fur rubbed against my arm. She went back to sleep carefree, her steady purring creating a calming song across the room. Avier landed on Cynthia's desk, his feathers ruffled slightly as though he had been caught in a wind blow. So, What's the latest trouble we've managed to find ourselves in? I questioned, sarcasm seeping from my voice. Cynthia chuckled, a twinkle of amusement in her eyes. Oh, you two always have a knack for finding yourselves in interesting situations. But this time, it's not trouble, it's an opportunity. Art's curiosity was immediately piqued, his eyes narrowing in intrigue as he leaned forward, his hands clasped together in front of him. An opportunity? What do you mean by that? With a solemn yet enthusiastic gaze, Cynthia leaned forward. Her tone softened to one of conspiratorial almostness. Well, 
I thought it would be a waste to have both of you as professors of the same class. She gave a dramatic pause, a playful twinkle in her eye. So I thought I'd have one of you become a professor for another class. Rejected. Goodbye, I declared without hesitation, already starting to rise from the couch, but before I could take more than a step, I felt Art's hand firmly grasping mine, his grip tight and unyielding. Come on now, Ree, let's at least hear what the director has to say, Art urged, his voice laced with an undercurrent of excitement as he tried to pull me back down onto the couch. Cynthia's eyes sparkled with anticipation, mirroring Art's own eagerness. I clicked my tongue in annoyance before begrudgingly settling back down, crossing my arms over my chest and leveling a skeptical gaze at the two of them. When did you both become so conspiratorial? I muttered, my tone dripping with subtle disdain. Cynthia chuckled at my skepticism, seemingly unfazed by my reluctance. Oh, don't be so dramatic, Re. It's not a conspiracy, it's an opportunity for growth and development, she explained, her smile unwavering. I huffed, still not fully convinced. Growth and development, huh? Sounds like a fancy way of saying more responsibility, I retorted, my brow furrowing in a mixture of wariness and resignation. Cynthia leaned back in her chair, her smile broadening. Well, responsibility does tend to come hand in hand with growth, re. But think about it. You have so much knowledge and talent to share. Becoming a professor for another class would give you a chance to inspire and guide students in a different subject area. My gaze narrowed as I studied Cynthia's expression, my voice tinged with caution. Cynthia, what is your true purpose with this? I asked, having learned long ago to be wary of her motives, for she was a master manipulator who always seemed to be playing the long game. Cynthia shook her head, her expression earnest and sincere. I already told you, I feel like it's a waste of both your talents if you're teaching the same class. She leaned forward, her voice taking on a persuasive tone. I just want to utilize the strengths and expertise of only the academy's best students, and with the two of you being the strongest mages here, you're more than qualified to become full-time professors, not just temporary ones. I narrowed my eyes at Cynthia, my skepticism still evident. Utilize our talents, huh? And what do we get in return? More work and less time for ourselves? I asked, my tone laced with caution. Cynthia met my gaze unflinchingly, her voice filled with sincerity. I understand your concerns, Re. But think about the profound impact you could have on the next generation of students. Sharing your vast knowledge and expertise can shape the future of the academy and the magical community as a whole. She paused, her lips curving into a slight smile. And as for compensation, there will be additional benefits and resources at your disposal to support you in your new roles. I frowned, still skeptical but finding it difficult to entirely dismiss her words. Come on, Re, the director has a point, Art chimed in, his voice brimming with enthusiasm. Plus, one of us is more than enough to handle the mana manipulation class. I let out a heavy sigh, feeling somewhat outnumbered by both Cynthia and Art's enthusiasm. I'll think about it, but no promises, I conceded, my voice laced with caution. Is there anything else? Cynthia's smile didn't falter, even as I didn't fully accept the job offer. She seemed confident that I would eventually come around, which only served to further pique my weariness. No, that's all for now, she replied, her voice tinged with a hint of satisfaction. Just remember to think it through, Re. This could be a chance for growth, not just for the students, but for you as well. Sensing that the discussion had reached its conclusion, I gently lifted Sylvie from her place on the arm of the sofa and carefully placed her on my head. I'll keep that in mind. Glancing at the clock, I realized we were about to have a meeting with the DC members, and I didn't want to be late. With a nod of farewell, I turned to leave the office, Art following closely behind. Less than less than aren't you going to accept the job? Greater than greater than CL's voice echoed through our soul corridor her sudden intrusion catching me off guard for a moment. The unexpected interruption caused me to pause, my brows knitting together as I processed her words. Greater than greater than were you listening the entire time? Less than less than I responded, a hint of mild irritation lacing my tone. Seal let out a lazy yawn, her boredom seeping through her words. Less than less than well, the class was becoming dreadfully boring, so I decided to eavesdrop on your thoughts instead. Greater than greater than her nonchalant attitude only served to further my mild exasperation. Less than so, why do you refuse to become a professor? Greater than Sylvia chimed in, her curiosity palpable in her melodic tone. 
Greater than greater than you too, Sylvia. Less than less than I sighed softly, my eyes flickering between the two girls. Greater than greater than I just don't want to shoulder the additional responsibilities and commitments that come with being a full-time professor. Being a temporary professor is different from being a full-time one. Less than less than. Less than come on, this won't cause any problems for you. I can help you too if you want. It's an opportunity to strengthen the academy's students, so why don't you take advantage of it? Greater than Sylvia's words carried a sense of conviction, her belief in me shining through. Less than less than Sylvia's right, you can still teach the mono manipulation class, since you're known as Cynthia's student, taking over as professor of this class won't cause too many doubts about your strength, if you're afraid of that. Greater than greater than Seal said. I paused for a moment, allowing their words to sink in. They both made valid points. Becoming a professor would grant me the opportunity to contribute to the growth and development of the students at the academy, something I had always desired. Greater than greater than all right, less than less than I finally conceded, a small smile tugging at the corners of my lips. Greater than greater than I'll give it a try. But on one condition. Less than less than. Less than less than what condition? Greater than greater than CL's curiosity was piqued, her interest evident in her tone. I could see the gears turning in her mind, as she anticipated my proposal. Greater than greater than I want both of you to be my teaching assistants, less than less than I declared, my gaze shifting between the two girls. Sylvia's eyes widened with excitement, and CL's lips curled into a mischievous grin. Less than less than less than deal. Greater than greater than greater than they exclaimed in unison, their enthusiasm palpable. Greater than greater than all right then, it's settled. Less than less than I smiled, a flicker of satisfaction coursing through me as I heard their enthusiastic agreement. Still, a nagging feeling in the back of my mind warned me that this decision might have unforeseen consequences. Well, the meeting wrapped up faster than I expected, Doradria muttered under her breath, her fingers drumming impatiently against the polished tabletop. Her restless energy was palpable, betraying her impatience with the slow pace of the proceedings. Art nodded in agreement, his expression one of casual indifference. Well, there don't seem to be any pressing issues that require our immediate attention, he remarked, leaning back in his chair with a subtle shrug. Curtis nodded in agreement, his expression reflecting a hint of satisfaction. Well, after the last incident, the students didn't dare to try something stupid and go against the leader's words. Fear can be a powerful motivator. Claire, her voice calm and measured, added, Indeed, the consequences of defying the leadership's orders have been made abundantly clear. The students have learned their lesson, at least for the time being, she said and handed me a stack of papers. Art stretched his arms above his head, his voice laced with nonchalant amusement. Isn't that a good thing? It just means less work for us. More time to relax and enjoy ourselves, he said, a carefree grin spreading across his face. I chuckled, nodding in agreement as I scanned the documents Claire had provided. I suppose you're right. It's certainly preferable to having to constantly address student related issues. Doradria sighed, her fingers still drumming against the table. I suppose you all have a point. It's just that I was hoping for a bit more excitement and action. These meetings can be rather dull, you know. A mischievous glint appeared in my eye as an idea formed, and I couldn't resist the urge to stir things up. You can always fight with art if you want, I suggested, leaning back in my chair and scanning through the papers. Fareth, a cup of coffee, please. The elf stood up from his seat and gracefully made his way to the small coffee station in the corner of the room, preparing a fresh cup with swift and fluid motions. Doradrea's eyes lit up with unbridled enthusiasm, a mischievous grin spreading across her features. Really? Can I? She exclaimed, her eagerness palpable. I met her gaze, a playful smile tugging at the corners of my lips. Of course, I replied, granting her permission with a subtle nod. Art raised an eyebrow, a hint of curiosity and skepticism crossing his expression. Wait, don't I get a say in this? He chimed in, his tone laced with mock protest. Doradria rolled her eyes, her mischievous grin transforming into a challenging smirk. Oh, come on, pretty boy. Don't be such a spoil sport. It'll be fun, she said, her voice dripping with playful taunting. Curtis chuckled, leaning back in his chair as he observed the exchange with an amused expression. You know, Doradria, I think Arthur might beat you. He's quite the skilled fighter. Doradria's eyebrow arched upwards, her challenging smirk becoming more pronounced. 
Oh, is that so? She mused, her tone laced with playful skepticism. Well, I guess we'll just have to find out, won't we? Without further ado, she pushed herself up from her chair, her movements graceful and fluid, and strode towards the designated sparring area, her steps filled with purpose and anticipation. Art mirrored Doradrea's actions, rising from his seat with a confident smirk on his lips. Challenge accepted, Doradrea, he said, his voice carrying a hint of amusement. But don't say I didn't warn you. I may be known for my looks, but I've got some skills up my sleeve too. Claire sighed, shaking her head in a display of feigned exasperation. Honestly, you too. Can't you find a more productive way to channel your energy? Her tone, though laced with a touch of resignation, held an underlying fondness for her teammate's antics. I couldn't help but laugh. Let them have their fun, Claire. It's good for morale. Besides, we've all earned a little break from the usual seriousness of our work. With that, I pushed myself up from my seat and joined Doradria in heading towards the sparring area, the rest of the team following suit. Once we reached the sparring area, I sat on the chair prepared in advance, and turned to face the team. Okay, so the spar will only be five minutes long. E.H. Why? Doradria tilted her head, her eyes narrowing with curiosity. Why only five minutes? That's hardly enough time. I chuckled, crossing my arms over my chest. Well, Doradria, you're not the only one who wants to spar, do you? Look at Theo here, he can barely control his urge to fight. I gestured towards the towering figure of Theo, who stood behind me, his muscles tense with anticipation. You all want to participate? Doradria's voice held a hint of surprise, her eyes scanning the room to meet the determined gazes of our teammates. Well, we don't get many chances to fight, especially with the leader, Curtis chimed in, his voice filled with eagerness. Kai leaned against the wall, his arms crossed. Looks like we've got ourselves a little impromptu sparring session, huh? Count me in. If you're all going to have one, then I'll definitely participate, Claire said, her tone laced with determination as she took a seat next to me. Kathleen, ever the quiet observer, nodded in agreement, her eyes reflecting her readiness to join in. Faerith returned with my coffee, placing it on the table in front of me with a polite smile. Here you go, boss, he said his voice soft and respectful. Thank you, Faerith, I replied, taking a sip of the steaming beverage. The rich aroma filled the air, invigorating my senses. With a twinkle in my eyes, I raised my cup. Now, let the battle begin. The room buzzed with excitement as the team prepared for the friendly competition ahead. Emma Helvanis Pov, are you both ready? I asked, my gaze shifting between James and Elisa as we stood before the ominous entrance of the frozen fane. The four of us, myself, Leo, and the two young mages, James and Elisa, had gathered at the threshold of this notorious B rank dungeon, its deceptive name belying the true challenges that lay within. Despite the expectation of an icy environment, the creatures that inhabited this place were known to possess a diverse array of magical abilities, making it a formidable test of our skills and determination. The towering archway loomed before us its darkness seeming to swallow any light that dared to venture too close. Leo fixed the pair with a stern, cautionary gaze, his voice heavy with experience. It won't be easy. Here, the moment you let your guard down, you're as good as dead. James, his features set with unwavering determination, adjusted the strap of his sword at his hip. I've trained tirelessly for this, he replied, his confidence evident in every word. Beside him, Elisa's hands trembled slightly as she tightened her grip on her ornately carved staff. She took a deep, steadying breath, her voice wavering as she admitted, I. I think so. This is my first time venturing into a dungeon. The nervous glance she cast towards the dark entrance betrayed her underlying uncertainty. Sensing Elisa's apprehension, I reached out and placed a reassuring hand on her shoulder. I know it's your first time, Elisa, I said gently, offering her an encouraging smile but you've shown immense potential in your magical abilities. Just trust in yourself and your training. Elisa met my gaze, her eyes reflecting a mixture of nervousness and determination. I'll do my best, she replied, her voice steadier than before. Although I had reservations about proceeding without our absent teammates, Jackson and Lara, we had no other choice if we wanted to fulfill Rimuru's order. Time was of the essence, and we could not afford to delay any longer. Taking a deep breath, I turned towards the entrance of the frozen fane. 
Let's not waste any more time. The dungeon won't wait for us. The entrance loomed before us, a gaping maw of darkness that seemed to swallow all light. With me positioned in the middle of the formation, Elisa by my side and Leo bringing up the rear, we followed behind James as he led the way into the darkness of the frozen fane. As soon as we crossed the threshold, the temperature just plummeted. The chill was biting at our skin and making our breath mist in the air. The narrow corridor was covered in these shimmering ice crystals clinging to the walls. They were reflecting the dim glow of our torchlight, giving this really eerie, otherworldly vibe to the whole place. It was dead silent, except for the echoing sound of our footsteps on the cold stone. Suddenly, this low, rumbling growl echoed down the hall, and we all froze. James instantly raised his sword, eyes narrowed as he scanned the shadows for the source. I could see Elisa's hands shaking a bit, but she steeled herself, determination burning in her eyes as she got ready to unleash her magic. From the darkness, a monstrous creature emerged, its icy blue eyes glinting malevolently as frost formed around its massive, razor-sharp claws. This confrontation marked James and Elisa's first encounter with the dungeon's formidable inhabitants. Get ready, I bellowed, my voice resonating with authority and command. James, keep a keen eye on the frost wolf's movements. Find an opening and strike with precision, I ordered, my tone firm and unwavering. Elisa, use your magic to weaken its defenses and create opportunities for James to attack. James nodded, his grip on his sword tightening as he studied the creature's every move. Stepping forward, his eyes locked onto the beast's icy gaze, determination etched across his face. Elisa nodded as well, her hands trembling slightly as she tightened her grasp on her staff. Positioning herself just behind James, she prepared to support him with her magic. Leo assumed a defensive stance, his keen eyes scanning the surroundings for any other potential threats. The frost wolf let out a deafening roar, its icy breath enveloping the air in a chilling mist. James charged forward, his sword slicing through the frozen atmosphere with precision. In retaliation, the creature swiped its massive claws, but James managed to evade the attack, his reflexes honed from countless hours of rigorous training. Elisa channeled her magic, conjuring a sphere of fire in her hands. With a flick of her wrist, she unleashed the fiery projectile towards the creature. The fireball exploded upon impact, engulfing the beast in a searing blaze. However, instead of succumbing to the flames, the creature seemed only further enraged. Even though this monster was only a B-rank beast, it was clear that their inexperience and slight nervousness were hampering our effectiveness. Despite their skills being higher than the challenge at hand, the intense, unfamiliar environment had they struggling to coordinate their efforts with the seamless precision they had honed through their training. James, enhance your sword with wind magic, Leo called out, his voice filled with authority and expertise. Although the frost wolf is powerful, its durability is a bit weak. James nodded, understanding the plan. He focused his magic, channeling the power of the wind into his sword. The blade shimmered with a faint green glow as the wind magic infused it, granting it increased sharpness and speed. As if sensing the change in the tide, the frost wolf lunged at James. But this time, James didn't try to dodge. Instead, he launched himself at the monster. Just as they were about to collide, James slid under the creature, only to be faced with a fireball that Elisa had fired at the now exposed monster. In a quick, seamless motion, James cut the frost wolf with his enchanted sword. I couldn't help but whistle in admiration as I witnessed their synchronized movements, while Leo applauded them with genuine pride. Marvelous teamwork, James and Elisa! I exclaimed, my voice filled with genuine admiration. You anticipated the frost wolf's actions and executed a flawless combination of skills. Well done. For novice fighters, you displayed exceptional coordination, particularly in that final maneuver, Leo added, acknowledging their progress. Without exchanging a word, James and Elisa had seamlessly understood each other's movements, reflecting the bond they had forged through their training. Thank you. Actually, we were working on it, James replied, his voice laced with a mix of pride and excitement. Kyle and Kyla were training us for that. Kyle and Kyla, huh? These twins were completely in sync, although there was some slight discrepancy in their personalities and actions, they were very understanding when it came to fighting. Yes, Kyle and Kyla have been invaluable in our training, Elisa chimed in, her voice filled with gratitude. They taught us how to coordinate our attacks and capitalize on each other's strengths. 
it's thanks to their guidance that we were able to pull off that last maneuver. Leo nodded in agreement, a faint smile playing on his lips. The twins are exceptional fighters themselves, and their ability to synchronize their movements is truly remarkable. It seems they passed on some of that skill to you both. James and Elisa exchanged a glance, we're still a long way from their level, but we're working hard to improve, James said, his voice tinged with determination. We want to become a team, just like them. Leo nodded, his expression serious. I have no doubt that you both have the potential to become just as skilled as Kyle and Kyla, if not more. Keep pushing yourselves, never stop learning, and always support each other. With Leo's words of encouragement ringing, we pressed on. James and Elisa continued to work together seamlessly, their movements becoming more fluid and their attacks more coordinated. James utilized his wind infused sword to deliver swift and precise strikes, exploiting the beast's weaknesses. Elisa used her magic to create strategic opportunities, weakening the creature's defenses and amplifying James's attacks. It was clear that, for two young adventurers, James and Elisa had developed an exceptional level of teamwork and combat prowess. Their ability to anticipate each other's actions and execute flawless combination attacks was a testament to their dedication and the guidance they had received from the twins, Kyle and Kyla. After clearing the first floor, we decided to take a much needed break. James and Elisa collapsed against the cool stone wall, their backs gratefully finding respite. The adrenaline from the intense battle was still coursing through their veins, but their weary bodies craved a moment of rest. As we took a moment to catch our breath, I surveyed the dimly lit chamber we had entered. The air was thick with the scent of damp earth, and the walls were adorned with intricate carvings depicting ancient runes and symbols. Great job, both of you, I said pride evident in my voice as I approached the exhausted duo. The flickering torchlight cast dancing shadows across their glistening faces. That was an impressive display of teamwork and skill. James looked up at me, a mix of exhaustion and exhilaration evident in his eyes. Beads of sweat glistened on his forehead, and his hands trembled slightly from the physical exertion. Thanks, Lady Emma, he replied, his voice slightly breathless. Elisa nodded in agreement wiping the sweat from her brow with the back of her hand. Strands of her chestnut hair clung to her face, damp with perspiration. I never thought I'd be able to face beasts like that, she admitted, a sense of awe and wonder in her voice. Seeing these two reminded me a lot of Kyle and Kyla, even though the twins were more experienced than James and Elisa on their first time in a dungeon, but they had displayed a level of coordination and prowess that rivaled the twins' own achievements. It has already been eight years since then, when Kyle and Kayla became adventurers, I still vividly recalled the eager expressions on their faces as they studied their adventure cards, their fingers tracing the embossed lettering. The memory of their youthful enthusiasm lingered in my mind, a bittersweet reminder of their growth and the passage of time. Kyle and Kyla had developed and honed their skills at an astounding pace, becoming formidable adventurers in their own right. But even they paled in comparison to true prodigies like Rimuru, Sylvia, and Arthur who had accomplished remarkable feats in a staggeringly short amount of time. But, well, I shouldn't compare the twins to those two, they're true geniuses. No, even the word, genius, will not justice them. I remember when Rimuru and Sylvia, along with Arthur, faced a rank S monster. A monster that any other adventurer would have run away from when they saw it, but they faced it without fear and beat it too, after only two years of being adventurers, only two years. I couldn't help but wonder how those three were faring. The last I had heard, Rimuru and Arthur had even become temporary professors at the academy, with Arthur earning that position in a rather, unconventional manner. A low growl pierced through the calm ambiance, catching my attention. I turned around to find James, his hand pressed against his grumbling stomach, a sheepish grin spreading across his face. Elisa couldn't resist chuckling at James's slightly embarrassed expression. Looks like someone's hunger has finally caught up with him, she teased playfully, a mischievous glint in her eyes. A faint blush crept onto James's cheeks as he nodded in agreement. Yeah, I suppose all that adventuring has worked up quite the appetite, he admitted, his stomach rumbling once more, as if to emphasize his point. Elisa's own stomach chose that moment to join the chorus, causing her to blush deeply and quickly cover her face with her hands. I couldn't help but laugh at their mutual embarrassment which only seemed to deepen their flushed expressions. It appears James isn't the only one feeling famished, I remarked with a playful grin, 
unable to resist the opportunity to tease them a bit further. Fortunately, I happened to procure some delectable sustenance from Gerd's renowned restaurant. I reached into the depths of my dimensional ring and retrieved the carefully packed boxes of mouthwatering food. James and Elisa's eyes widened in delight as the tantalizing aroma of the meal wafted towards them. Their hunger seemed to intensify at the mere sight and smell of the sumptuous feast. James's silver eyes shone with anticipation, while Elisa's emerald green orbs sparkled with gratitude. Wow, Lady Emma, you really do come prepared, James exclaimed, his voice filled with genuine appreciation. Elisa nodded eagerly, her eyes gleaming with excitement. A soft chuckle escaped my lips as I relished their reaction. Indeed, a seasoned adventurer knows the importance of being well nourished, I replied, handing each of them a box filled to the brim with culinary delights. Now, indulge and savor, for you have truly earned this feast. With eager anticipation, they opened their boxes, revealing a mouthwatering spread of flavors before them. The fragrant scent of succulent roasted chicken, accompanied by a medley of steamed vegetables and fragrant herbs, filled the air. James took a bite of the perfectly cooked poultry, his eyes closing in blissful satisfaction. Im, this is beyond amazing, he mumbled through a mouthful of food. Elisa nodded fervently, her mouth full of tender steamed vegetables. Absolutely, Lady Emma, you are truly the best, she managed to say between grateful bites. A warm smile illuminated my face as I basked in their genuine appreciation. As I savored a bite of my own meal, relishing the explosion of flavors on my tongue, I couldn't help but marvel at Gerd's culinary mastery. Not only was he considered one of the finest chefs in our ranks, but his talent had also been recognized by Rimuru, who had encouraged him to open a restaurant in the bustling city of Zyrus. Through Gerd's ingenuity and Rimuru's wise counsel, his restaurant had swiftly became a celebrated establishment, renowned not just in Sapin but also in Eleanor and Darv. In just seven short years, Gerd had expanded his culinary empire, delighting countless palates with his artistry and passion for gastronomy. Leo, who had been diligently scouting the area to ensure there were no remaining beasts, returned to us with a satisfied smile on his face. All clear, Leo announced, his voice calm and composed. No signs of any more threats in the vicinity. We should be safe to rest here for a while. I nodded appreciatively at Leo's efficiency and dedication to our safety. His skills as a tracker and his keen senses were invaluable assets to our team. Thank you, Leo. Leo inclined his head slightly, a small smile gracing his lips. It's my duty, Emma, I returned his smile before inviting him to sit next to me and giving him the lunchbox prepared for him. Leo graciously accepted the lunchbox, taking a seat beside me. We'll rest for a couple of hours, after that we'll start hunting monsters instead of killing them, so make sure you both get a good rest. Leo said as he looked at James and Elisa. Hi. James and Elisa responded in unison, their voices brimming with enthusiasm and determination.